from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We are here covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2020, November 17th to the, to the 20th, a virtual event. Normally we're there in person, but again, 2020 has been a crazy year. We're not going to be able to there, be there in person, but we're here remotely. We've got two great guests, the co-chairs of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon, Stephen Agassa, senior open source engineer at VMware, KubeCon Kubernetes chair, and Constance Garmanolis, principal software engineer at Splunk. You guys are the co-chairs of KubeCon. Big responsibility. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you okay, for so we the number one question every year is before it gets started is, how'd you make the selections for the talks? What's the hottest thing going on? What's the focus for this this KubeCon? Well, so actually we use a Ouija board to choose the talks. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. That doesn't happen that way. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much a, a lot of a hat. But but seriously, we um, we spent a lot of time with talks that showed. Uh, I guess, diversity and integration um, in the community. So uh, what projects are starting to pick up steam? What projects are starting to integrate more deeply with other ones? Um, so you'll, you'll see lots of uh, commentary around uh, multi-cluster uh, uh, items within uh, cloud native technologies, as well as lots of, uh, lots of content on security, which I'm excited about. Yeah. I also think too, like, there's a little bit like, kind of to your point about like, things layered on like we're starting to get to the point where people are talking about like hey i deployed kubernetes and envoy and something else and like these are starting to be a lot more of these kind of joint talks there that actually even make it harder for us to place like does it belong in networking does it belong in application development like there have been some really good challenges trying to figure out where things are slotted and what's right you know one of the things i love about kubecon besides being fun uh, to go to when it was face to face is even with the virtual it's still a great community the talks are awesome. People are submitting talks, um, but you got the sixth year. I think it's the sixth year, fifth year. We, I mean, we've been there for all years. I think this is the sixth year for us. The maturation, the growth, and of Kubernetes now is pretty clear. This glue layer, this gluing things together, the APIs extending to service and more services. Um, can you guys comment on what you guys are seeing in terms of some of the practical projects and how they're playing out for developers? Because you're starting to see you know, more clusters, you got cloud, you got multi-cloud around the horizon. So you got more of these conversations where you have more capabilities, but the focus on the modern application building is the number one business focus. So, you know, the developers are trying to build out under the covers and say, hey, how do I scale this? So this seems to be the kind of a growth year and inflection point for that next level. It seems that next level, uh, Stephen, what's your thoughts and reaction to that? Yeah, absolutely. So as a former, uh, I've been at a few cloud native companies at this point. So uh, CoreOS and Red Hat before uh, heading over to VMware. And as a former field engineer and solutions architect um, at, at some of these places, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking through um, what is the day zero, day one story, right? And it, it's very clear that as a community, we've gotten to the point where like, that is that is officially the boring stuff, right? Seeing uh, seeing a lot of the features within uh, projects like uh, KubeADM and uh, and Cluster API come to maturation, uh, we start to focus a lot more on that developer story, right? And ultimately, that's that's what we care about, right? Uh, businesses are not necessarily looking for a new tool to play around with, right? There are business yeah. goals that are uh, that are tied to the new technologies, right? So uh, the the velocity in which you deploy your applications, the the feedback loop in, in terms of understanding, uh, you know, what ties into your application, where things are going wrong, and you know, Constance can definitely speak to the uh, the observability layer uh, for for all of these cloud native applications. So. Constance, observability, I hear, is really hot right now. What did you, what's your take on it? I yeah. mean, there's observability everywhere. New startup comes out. You you work at Splunk. They're the king king of observability. They started out with a very small observation space. Now it's a full platform. You have to look at the observation space to get the data. That's the internet. Yeah. That's every application. What's hot in observability? Take us through your thoughts. I think what's also starting to like, so you're still like, there's some, I can think of like one talk right now, it's a little, a little bit talking about like, you know, observability at scale in the sense of just like, 
now we have these massive applications as a we global we and to observe and monitor observe right now i'm not going to use the two words interchangeable i know that's a totally different debate debatable top, topic but for now let's keep it at that um but it's also now i think one thing as the observability space is maturing is we're, ta we're not talking only about like hey i need to my like application with metrics logs traces or some other thing there it's now being a little bit more critical about how if i'm using all three of these or all different telemetry different telemetries like how to be smart about it. like okay i only need to use traces for some things i only need to use logs for something else and like kind of getting to a richer part of like now that we have that data let's actually think about better ways to use that data so we don't you know collect everything because you can't collect everything as much as we want to well i mean this is something that i want to get your both thoughts on because one of the conversations we're hearing from developers when we hear it from the on the business side is everything's as a service that's like the ivory tower you know the cxos Everything's as a service. And then it gets down into the developers and the engineering communities and they're like, well, it's not that easy because you got tools for every platform, right? And that's a problem. You got these siloed tools or tools that are were built for certain products. And then you got this systems thinking. You guys talk about this integration as a key area. So making everything as a service just isn't that easy, right? So the goal is to make it easy, right? So this is the, the systems conversation. How do you guys look at that from a KubeCon, Cloud Native Con? Because Cloud native does enable a lot of good things. It's horizontally scalable cloud from a resource standpoint. You've got programmability. You can look at it as a system, but people are stuck with these tools for the platform. I mean, you have tools for this, tools for that, five different tools. How do you make observability work? How do you make security work? These are tough questions. Yeah, What's your reaction to that? I think that uh, a lot of it comes down to um, from a builder perspective and you know, taking the builder perspective and then also taking the consumer perspective. For builders, and I actually spent some time with, uh, with some developer heads in, in New York. Uh, we, we sat down for a dinner and kind of talked talk through some of the problems um, in, in the space. And I think what it really comes down to is when we build tools, we need to think about who we're building the tools for. Right. There are multiple personas that you might look at in the cloud native space. And, um, you know, one might be the persona of that of, of that systems integrator uh, of the the uh, classic uh, OPSI, DevOpsy SRE role. Right. Then you've got uh, someone who may be building uh, tools on top of one of those ops platforms. Right. And then you've got the the consumers that maybe in your company, maybe they're external, right? That for their experience, they're really only interested in how do I ship my app, right? So whether we're talking about building out Kubernetes or whether we're talking about a serverless platform, right? So serverless and the cloud, right? You often hear the uh, it runs on, it's it's running on someone else's machine, right? You know, it's not really um, so. I, so I think in, in in that space, you have to consider uh, developer experience, right? Um, so I think one of the overarching themes that you'll see throughout this KubeCon is how do we talk about the developer experience? Who are we building these tools for? How can we how can we actually get outcomes that that end users are looking for? Right? Because it's not again, it's not about the tools; it's about the outcomes for for the respective businesses. So. Constant, what's your reaction to, to to this trend of tools and uh, edge? You got edge computing because you you don't want to have to build security for everything single thing. If I got an edge device. I want to have that be software operated, right? It makes total sense, but making that happen is hard. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this is something that as a community, like we're really, I guess like kind of how I use the example of like end user docs versus reference documentation. I think that we've been done a really good job at creating these really powerful tools, but like in terms of we still need to simplify them for anyone who doesn't want to learn, like say Kubernetes or Envoy or open telemetry like the back of their hand. And I think that's where we're starting to close, we're finally starting to close that gap. And that's I think also why KubeCon is getting a lot more popular is like now things are a little bit more accessible to those who don't have, you know, either don't have the bandwidth or it just it isn't in their interest to learn all these things in deep details. And so we're slowly going from those who want to be deep, deep experts into, yeah, I kind of want to play around with it and make it more manageable. And um, I do think we still have quite a bit of ways to go. Like I think you know, what's been helpful, like at least like our end user stories that we get and like the application development track, especially that one, like the case studies that there's no longer a track, but it is highlighted as like these talks can be case studies. I think that shows, it's kind of giving people more like, hey, these are stories of how I can take these tools and start making them more digestible in my own way. Because going from like, oh, this feature does X, Y, Z to this is a whole story they can do around it. It's been a little bit of a gap. Um, 
we're closing. Yeah, and I think one of the things about you, you kind of being shy there, I'll say it, KubeCon and um, Cloud Native Con, CNCF in general, has been very successful because of the end user focus, I will say that, but also the ecosystem of the vendors that are there. So you have kind of the best of both worlds um, and they all want to, they all want to get better, right? So, yeah. but they all got to make money at the same time. So you have this balance, it's open source, it's what it is, it's out in the open. Can you guys comment on how the community is thriving and surviving? We're in a tough time with the pandemic. It's been a big challenge. Obviously we're not in person, we're remote. Um, how how is everything going with the community? Because it's such a great end user vendor community working together out in the open shipping code, trying to make things better. What's the what's the state of the community? Yeah, so I would say that um, honestly, what it comes down to is that word community. We are uh, we are all friends, right? There are people who you know as the as we as we move towards this kind of like cloud native consolidation of companies. Um, a lot of us have worked together before, right? A lot of us are active in, in multiple communities and it, what comes out of that is, is really open and honest collaboration as a result. Um, you know, even, even today there's a, there's a Twitter thread going, uh, you know, I, I started talking about uh, the Kubernetes release cadence, right? And, and if, and how it should change. Given 2020, we had an extended, uh, we had an extended release cycle for uh, 119. Right. And, and questions became, what do we do? Like, do we continue with three releases a year? Do we try for, do we switch back to four? Like, what does that look like? Right. And, and reaching out across the Kubernetes community, across the CNCF TOC, the uh, contributor strategy SIG in, uh, in CNCF and, and getting feedback from all of these people who, who depend on the products that we build uh, day to day. Is is huge. So I think I think what it comes down to really is is open and honest collaboration. I think you know when you are when you are strained. I know that everyone has a lot going on in life right now. Um, what's what's great about it is 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 being forthcoming with that. Right. We have all of these teams that are that are built to support the people that are around them. So um, if, if anything, I you know I, I'd love to see all of the, the collaboration and, and, and feedback coming from everyone who works on these projects day to day. Yeah. Constance, and, what's your reaction? I mean, one, I've talked to some developer friends of mine, they're like, hey, this is great. I've, I can work virtually. I've been doing it for years anyway. So no big deal. It's not like the people who have to go to the office every day. So they're used to virtual format. The other comment was, I get more time to do some gaming too. Um, and <laughs> trying to make light out of the bad situation. But yeah. you know, it is serious. What's your reaction to the survival and the thriving, continuing thriving of the community. Yeah, um, I also want to eventually go back to you because you're making a comment about vendors and now this is my first time as vendor. I have interesting, I like, it's a really interesting perspective to come from, but um, let's talk about the community. I think like, you know, it's like one of the things that like, I think actually has been one of the highlights of this year for, for me for 2020 is like to be co-chair, but it's also just to like be able to work with Steven and Nancy and the rest of the CNCF community. And also like any attendees like has actually, even though this is a big year of change and it's, you know, it was a change that no one was planning. Um, it has definitely been like really nice to just get to, like KubeCon, I guess let me say it as an example of the story, like for KubeCon EU, like I was surprised by how many people were engaged in the Slack channel and asking questions and like Priyanka had set up these happy hours and people were just joining and we're starting to talk. And so it wasn't quite hallway track, but we still had that connection. And there was definitely, there are people who are attending from all parts of the world. And I thought that was really nice. Like, we, I think CNCF has made it, like they have made the statement before that there will always be a virtual component to it to address the fact that, you know, our community, we're so used to it being in person, but that does, you know, it does reduce accessibility to those who can't travel away right? or for whatever reason, they can't be there in person. So now it is becoming more open. And I don't know, um, I mean, kind of tying back a little bit, a little bit derail, a little bit derailing, but to your comment about like, also like the vendors. And so this is my first time being a part of a vendor and, I think what's really interesting is like there's this natural like, you know, tension between like, oh, some people are like, oh, I don't want anything from the vendors or like I only want things from the end users. But I think the thing we kind of forget is that both of them are like active, you know, they're active in the community, both in either contrib contributing or enabling others to be successful using the CNCF projects. And so we all have, you know, valid points and perspectives on it, right? Like you can maybe sometimes argue that sometimes being a vendor is almost a bonus 
because you get to talk to maybe more people who are trying to adopt technology and you get to see trends. And then after as an end user, you get to say like, hey, I have this really unique problem here and this is how I try to solve it and share that story with other people. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, there's a checks and balance I've observed over my years in open source. You've seen certain things thrive certain ways. And I think that balance, and but having the mission and a, kind of a rules of engagement have always seemed well, uh, good, worked well for CNCF. They embrace the vendors really well, but they're, I mean, I won't say paranoid because that's my word, but like they're paranoid of the vendors. I would be too. Like, you know, I want to get their fingers in the pie, but they're also contributing. So there's always been that checks and balance. And that's what's been magical, I think, about it is that they fostered the community, they fostered the engagement, and they fostered that balance. And I think that's where the give and get comes in. I think that's a healthy community. Um, yeah. And I just love to see and love to be involved with it. So it's super, super good. Uh, approach. Now, putting back the vendor hat on, if I'm a vendor, I want a competitive advantage. So, you know, this brings us to the next gen conversation. Open source goes in going next gen. You're seeing a big focus on AI. You're seeing a big focus on, you know, edge computing, which is going to be software operated, software defined, which cloud native will lead. I got to get your perspective on something Stephen said at the top was security. Um, every conversation for the past five months with devs has been shift left. <laughs> so, okay, where are we going <laughs> left? We're shifting left. This is about security. How do you build security in? This has been a big conversation. It's not an easy problem. I know it's a top focus. Uh, I want to get your reaction. Steven, we'll start with you and then Constance, I'd like you to weigh in too. Yeah, sure. So security, security is tricky, right? Um, and I think that people start to put the focus on security when it's a little too late, right? Um, the, the the move is always uh, preventative as, as opposed to reactive, right? Um, and security is an onion, right? So, so it's not enough to, to just think about security on, on one axis, right? It's, you know, how is this affecting, you know, how is this affecting my application, the systems that I build, the physical, uh, you know, the physical restraints of, of the, uh, you know, of, of the area, right? Infrastructure, um, the cloud providers that I'm running on, Right? Uh, are they are they a, a certain level of compliant? Right? Um, especially when that that comes up for federal customers. Right? Um, uh, on the application side. Right? Uh, you know, if you think of you know if you think of all the 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 different ways that you can break an application uh, that that hurt security. Um, now with the the cloud native space uh, container security. Right? Are, am I building? Am I building? Uh, safe Docker files, right, or, or, or build packs or what have you, how, however you package your applications. Um, and, and, and ultimately you have to, you know, and then, and then there's also the supply chain, right? How am I getting, how am I moving that stuff from some physical infrastructure or some cloud infrastructure into the hands of, of the developers, into the hands of the customers? How do I react to changes uh, once, those, once those applications have actually been deployed, right? Um, so like all of these things to consider and, and when you look at that space, these are multiple teams, right? These are dozens and dozens of teams across, you know, multiple companies, right? You may not have, uh, you may not have full control of your security story, right? So I think that what, you know, what you need to do is, is start the conversation internally about how, how we can build security at multiple layers, right? So some of the things that are, are kind of interesting to see uh, pop up during this KubeCon and, and some of uh, you know and some of the last ones, the uh, the continued uh, the continued work that's happening on uh, OPA and Gatekeeper, um, Spiffy and Spire, right? And and you know all of these all of these frameworks for authentication and and authorization that are kind of cropping up, right? I think you know Spiffy and Spire. A uh, really interesting story because you know the first thing you think is I have I have these cloud native applications that I'm building and I also have these legacy applications right how can I build a bridge between the two right and then you've also got things like uh, you know service mesh right and you start to talk about service mesh and and you know the security within applications that live inside a cluster or cross cluster right and how you negotiate that so. Tons of things to think about, and you know, it's it's honestly gonna it's honestly gonna depend on where you are in your journey. But I think that you know, good security is only built by having the conversation and having the conversation across all teams and doing it before before you get into trouble. 
<laughs> do it before you get in trouble. Have it baked in from the beginning. <laughs> Brush your teeth. Make sure you're all healthy. Right. Your, rea your, rea your reaction. <laughs> your reaction. Um, so I will say, like, I am unfortunately one of those people that, like, security... Well, security is just not something that... I guess I'm going to say I find super exciting and mostly just because I, I really love observability and like service mesh. And so I usually defer to the experts on that. Um, but I do want to like, I guess, plus one, some of what Stephen said, uh, obviously using GitHub, um, you know, terminology for <laughs> plus one, you know, uh, enhancing things like definitely start it early. And I, but I think, you know, start it early, start a conversation, but I think we also need to just be cognizant of like for any of the technologies, like if it's security, say networking, whatever, all of these things are behavior changes and just bucket more time than you think you're going to need. Um, yeah. There's going to be so many roadblocks. And especially when it comes, like, especially when it comes to behavior changes, like if you're and behavior, but not like necessarily like a personal, but like, you know, technology behavior, like you're used to sending things without MTLS, right. Or, you know, with our RBACs, things are going to fail and, you know, it's, there's going to be that initial friction. And so definitely trying to make this as smooth as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the focus I like to see more of, which is having it be built in. So if you're really not into it, it but you don't want to screw it up either. So you want to be on top of it without doing it, right? That's the end game, right? That's what DevOps is about, right? So if you don't have programming infrastructure, write code. So, by, so all these things, this is the trend. This is the trend that we're seeing in cloud native. Um, can you guys share your thoughts this year on, on, on the most important stories that you think people should think about or lean into, or at least look at for KubeCon? What are some of the things um, that attendees or people watching remotely or participating virtually or in the Slack channels, what should they pay attention to? So starting with, I, I, think, I think even with the last KubeCon um, and some of the products that have recently come out um, from certain vendors, um, we're starting to look a lot more at the, um, what is that conversion story for someone who is a classic sysadmin, right? Who may be learning uh, all, uh, about cloud native technology for the first time, or who, or how do we, um, you know, how do we welcome a new KubeCon attendee to the, the community? So I think one of the best things that we did was uh, instantiate that uh, 101 track, right? So with the 101 track, uh, I, I think we, we got a bunch of great feedback. Um, so we worked to make sure that there were uh, actually, we we eliminated. I believe we fully eliminated the the lightning talks, and um, and work to include more 101 content as well as uh, tutorials within this within this uh, program. Yeah. Constant, your react. Constant, your reaction to our thoughts on the most yeah. important story to pay attention to. I think it's more um, right because. Okay, and I know this is like a common line that we say at KubeCon and like, you know, depend what journey you're on. But since so many more of our talks are now talking about intersections between like, you know, using X and Y, to try to build Z, Z. Oh my goodness, I'm trying, I'm losing my Zs. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, um, I think trying to like, you know, looking for those talks that at least somewhat resonate, like, hey, I've already adopted Kubernetes. Let me see how I add Envoy. Like, trying to find those there because there's a lot more of that content now right because maybe you know about like two three even last KubeCon or like last KubeCon North America a lot of the things were more focused on like one project maybe a hint there, and you're just going to see more of these combinations and so there are a lot more there's a lot more of that content available for you to find I'm doing two three maybe four it's a lot of projects at once adoptions um and seeing how that works too and yeah 101 track has definitely been definitely like a great hit I'm gonna say right. Yeah. Uh, EU was the first time it was launched, and we got so many um, CFPs for 101. It was just amazing to see all these ways that people wanted to make KubeCon more accessible to everyone else who hasn't been a part of. You know, it's every year. It's it's, it's every year the onboarding of new members of the community has been impressive, and having that track or laddering or different ways to work as a community to help people along has been another. Um, thing I noticed you guys do really well on. There's a, there's a real camaraderie amongst the community. So uh, hat tip to you guys on that. Final question uh, for you guys is uh, more about the format. Uh, obviously it's virtual this year. Um, the game is still the same. There's talks, there's people, there's hallways, but they're virtual. I guess you're you know, virtually walking through Slack and Discord or Twitter or whatever. Um, 
What's the learnings from last event? As we're going into virtual, how does an attendee maximize their time, their engagement? There's times to lean in and be present, attending a talk. You mentioned Slack, Constance. What's some of the learnings um, that you guys have learned from virtual? And what can people think about and prepare for for KubeCon virtual this year? Yeah, um, I think one way you start, so there's actually a resource, uh, this came from our debrief from EU, it was like, there's a resource like, hey, let me help get the day off. And like, we even provide a template to like provide to your, you know, direct to your manager, say like, can I please get this day off so I can focus on it? And I think that's one thing that, and I think we've all probably seen on Twitter and uh, blogs is that even though it is virtual, it is still, it is still a brain drain, right? It's still, you know, you have to engage with the topic. So set aside time. I would probably even say attend fewer talks than you would normally do in person, right? There is Zoom fatigue. Um, I guess it's in Trotto fatigue. Um, so just give yourself a lot more space to uh, consume the information and just debrief. And also join the activities, right? Like ask questions in Slack. There's a lot of the virtual events, like there's bingo. Um, there's even an escape room, which sounds like a lot of fun. All these different activities too <laughs> that you can do with everyone. So like definitely enjoy that part, right? Because you still get a little bit of opportunity to say like, hey, you mentioned this project, let's chat offline. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you may be on a four hour long Zoom meeting talking about some project. And so, yeah. Yeah, I noticed the hang space kind of mindset of virtual is pretty cool. Um, be mindful to introduce yourself and yeah. either do a sidebar or jump on some back channel. I mean, there's plenty of tools, developers know what they are. So good, good point. I want to call that out. Good, good point, Constance. Steven, your thoughts on uh, learnings from the virtual format and then things this year people should pay attention to and jump in and, and use the site for. Yeah, so I, I would say if, if anything, uh, the uh, previous attendees gave lots of thoughtful feedback about how to improve the, the overall program. Um, one of my favorite parts of any conference, and it's the part that I prioritize more than anything else in the conference, even the talks, right? Is is the hallway track, right? It's it's one of the few times, you know, especially with KubeCon and and the various contributors across the cloud native space. Um, that's the you know the one time every quarter or so that I get an opportunity to see these people face to face, right? So you know we wanted to to do our best to bring an experience that felt, uh, you know, it's 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 not the you know it's not the same as the, the physical hug, right? Or the uh, you know. Or going out for you know, or going out for dinner after uh, a long day, um, but we we tried and we, and, and we uh, threw through lots of crazy ideas at the event team yeah. <laughs> to see what they would come up with. Um, for me, yeah. as a uh, New York resident, um, and having a conference that is uh, NA virtual but would have been in in Boston. Um, I thought it was important uh, thinking about screen fatigue as well as just the the physicality of where people would have been at the time um, was the start is the start time of the of the conference right um, so as Constance was was mentioning uh, screen fatigue it's I think I think with all of the virtual conferences uh, going on it's very hard to to have that time during the day right so this KubeCon for folks on the East Coast. Um, it starts basically at your lunchtime. So the idea is hopefully you get some, you get some of your meetings in for the day, yeah. grab a bite to eat, and then you sit down uh, for lunch and you, uh, and you dig into some KubeCon. So. Yeah, and you can have any lunch you want and then off to deal with the lunch from the conference. Um, that's <laughs> awesome. The, the thing I love about the, what you guys said is the hallway tracks. And I think one of the things I've noticed going to a lot of virtual events and doing them is, um, Constance, you're right. There's, it's it's mentally draining to lean into a talk because you're present, even though you're virtual. Yeah. So taking time to get involved in the fun activities or just you know wandering Slack or doing the sidebar or the hallways is kind of a not a, some time off, but the time to regroup and not be so you know leaned into a session. I find that to help on the fatigue side for sure. The other one is viewing parties. We 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 popped into some you know zooms together and we watched the <laughs> we watch each other watch the session right. So um, viewing parties has been one trick I've seen work well. Uh, other ones I've seen people toast beer at a certain time. Um, the Germans obviously do it first because they're on the time zone. But uh, you start to see these playful things. You know uh, people can share their 
um, kind of position where they are. So it's fun. We're looking forward to seeing that. Um, okay, final comment, Stephen, Constance. What's the bumper sticker this year for KubeCon? Ooh, have we have we decided yet, Constance? <laughs> <laughs> Velvet jackets are required for entry. <laughs> <laughs> that will make more sense after you see a, a special message from us. <laughs> <laughs> see a lot of fashion on stage. On, on stage. Right? Um, All right, know. we stumped the co-chairs. <laughs> we stumped the. Well, I want to say thank you very much for coming on and sharing a um, little color commentary on KubeCon or on the program, some of the things on the virtual event too, some of the talks, really appreciate it. And we really appreciate what you do, the community does. It's been a hard year. We're not gonna be there in person. Uh, we'll continue to ride the wave in to back to the normal. So thanks for doing what you're doing. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, this is the Cube's virtual coverage of KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, virtual November 17th to the 20th. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. Thanks for watching.